I'm Jennifer Gunn. Welcome to the Institute for Advanced Studies and a study singular. Oh my gosh, how many times have I corrected that? Uh, and, uh, and Thursday's at four. I just want to point, make a couple of announcements. Usually it's my job to interrupt at the end of the program, and I hate that part. Now I hate that we're even interrupting at the beginning. But uh, I just want to welcome our guests and make a couple of announcements. There is a sign-in sheet if this is your first time at the IAS, if you'd like to receive information from us about our fabulous programs like today's, uh, please sign up on the sign-in sheet on the left. There are also some flyers there for about our upcoming programs. And I want to remind everybody that March 10th, we're going to be celebrating the 10th anniversary of the IES during Thursdays at 4 and with a reception afterwards. So uh, feel free to uh, come back for that. And also, for those of you who haven't found your way around Northrop in the past, there's a new little theater that, uh, with, the, with the reconstruction of the building on the very top floor, the fourth floor, and there's a gallery out, outside that and a new exhibit that just opened, A Legacy of Legendary Artists, which celebrates 45 years of Northrop's acclaimed dance series. Okay, next week, coming previews. Next week is going to be Richard Hirsch from um, Virginia Tech talking about energy consumption and economic growth, the history and possible future of an altered relationship. That will be right here in this room, Thursdays at 4 next week. But on Wednesday, the day before, there's a special event with Richard Hirsch. Um, and please note, this is a really cool event, but it's an RSVP event. Uh, infrastructure Art and Energy <coughs> with one of the IAS um, collaborative Research and Creative Collaboratives Combined Heat and Power. It will, there's going to be a reading of a play if you want to volunteer to read a part, let Sharon Fishlowitz know uh, when you RSVP. But a, a play from the 1930s, Power, a Living Newspaper. And then, for those who RSVP, there will, the first part is open to anybody, but, um, but because of limited numbers, uh, if you want to go on a tour of the Southeast Steam Plant, please RSVP. And then from 4.45 to 5.30, back at the sub factory, which is in St. Anthony, Maine, uh, there will be a reception. So um, there's more information about that on the IAS website and the contact information to, our, to uh, let people know you'd like to come. Okay, so now we get to the, back to the fun stuff, which is today's program. Thunder Drums Exploring Tycho and its Impact on Cultural Identity through performance, and obviously some of you have been getting oriented already. So we're going to shift gears a little bit for the next hour to um, do more exploration and benefit from performance about Tycho itself. And then at 5, we'll end that formal part and invite you to stay for 30 to 45 minutes for an interactive <laughs> workshop so you get to uh, experience what you've just been watching. And, uh, and so that's kind of the order for the day. It's my great pleasure to introduce Jennifer Weir, who is an original member and now the artistic director of Mood Dico, which was founded in 1997 by Rick Xiaomi. And she's a, she's a student, a teacher, a performer, and a composer of Tycho. And recently she premiered five new compositions or arrangements at Mood Dico's Inside the Beat concert. She's very multi-talented, the kind of person that humbles you when you realize all of the ways in which uh, uh, she, she contributes to um, the world and to uh, the intellectual environment we, we would like to live in. So she's been a, a recipient of the American Composer for, the Composers Forum's Live Music for Dance Minnesota grant. That's just one of many grants she's won. And she's also the theater director and dramaturg for Moo Performing Arts. So I'll introduce our other two uh, panelist speakers today, and then I'll turn the program over to Jennifer. So Josephine Lee is a professor of English and American Studies here at the University of Minnesota, and her most recent book, co-edited with Rick Xiaomi and Don Idol, is Asian American Plays for New Generation. Among many, many other books and articles, she is the author of Performing Asian America, Race and Ethnicity on the Contemporary Stage. 
And returning to the boards or the rugs of the Crosby Seminar Room is uh, Cindy Garcia, who was a fellow, a residential fellow in the fall here at the IAS, uh, who is an associate professor of theater arts and dance. And while she was here as an IAS fellow, she worked on her play, How to Make It to the Dance Floor, a salsa guide for, for women based on actual experiences. And she's also the author of a relatively recently published book, Salsa Crossings, Dancing Latinidad in Los Angeles. So that's our panelists, and I'm going to turn you over to, to Jennifer to lead us through the next hour. Oh, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for having us here. This is a great opportunity for us. And um, for those who are new, um, we're going to we're going to play. We're going to, we've been talking about drumming now for a little while, um, which has been great, and I really appreciate everyone's questions and, and, and curiosity about things. Um, so we're just going to play two pieces, and then we'll go ahead with a panel and a discussion, and um, then at the very end we'll finish off with one more song before we sort of let those who want to um, get on with your day sneak out, and then the, the rest of you will give you a, a mini workshop. Um, the piece we're going to perform is, is uh, an arrangement of Matsuri, Matsuri being a, a generic word for festival and sort of the festival rhythms we've been talking about earlier. This is, again is the first song that I ever saw um, played on a taiko drum. It's the first song that we ever teach our students and so it sort of holds a, a special place for all of us. So this is Matsuri. <clears throat> Oh, one more thing. If you need to cover your ears, we will not take that as an insult. Please, <laughs> please protect your eardrums as necessary. <coughs>
Pounding Hooves, which was written by, again, our original founding director, Rick Shioni. And in his mind, he pictured um, a herd of wild horses gaining speed as they sort of start running across the field and gaining more and more momentum and power behind them. Um, So this is a small space, and you can feel the energy coming off from just a couple of players. And again, imagine that, then multiplied by 10, 20, with drums of all sizes, and you can really feel what a like visceral impact Tycho can make, um, which is part of the thing that I, that I love so much. Oh, And now, if you are in Mitchell's Girls class, <laughs> you'll know, you better listen.
So now we will move to Professor Josephine Lee. Yeah, this is a really tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> I always think of it as it's sort of like now is this sort of bummer <laughs> time. I, I, but I'll start with my own uh, anecdote about taking a baby Tycho class, which I did with uh, some other people who were in the room. And, boy, you know, Matsuri looks a lot better than professionals. <laughs> it sounds a lot better. So I'm, I'm just going to throw out some ideas about thinking about Tycho, which, you know, is one of those things that I think you'll all agree is really easy to like, right? Um, and, but in some ways, thinking about it as a kind of cultural representation of Asian Americanness, right? It's, it's a harder thing to pin down. Um, much harder in some ways than um, what I normally work on is theater and drama, which kind of wears its politics on its sleeve, right? So what is exactly is Asian American and about Tycho? So I'm just going to give a little background um, and point you to a few more resources. Um, I don't actually do work on Tycho. I would say that the scholar who's done the most work is Deborah Wong, my colleague at uh, UC Riverside, who's an ethnomusicologist, and she's also uh, a Tycho performer. Um, but she is working on a book uh, on Tycho, uh, which will include a lot of history as well as um, uh, some sort of more interpretive material. Um, but she has a, um, some uh, uh, things to say about Tycho in her uh, book from 2004 on Asian Americans in music. Um, she also talks about Asian Americans performing uh, other kinds of music, like uh, classical music or uh, jazz, hip hop, and the like. She has a good online article, and I, I took some of what I'm going to say from this article, so I thought I would just cite her um, about uh, a jazz artist, Tatsu Aoki, um, and his experimentation in Taiko. So um, just a little background. Um, you know, Taiko is, uh, sometimes people are tempted to think that Taiko is very, very old. Um, but in fact, in the form that we know it, it's a relatively contemporary form of uh, performance. Um, and people really trace it to a kind of uh, sort of um, folklorized idea, right? In, the, in other words, not an authentic kind of folklore, but something that is performed to almost resemble a folk part of folk culture. And in Japan, uh, I think it really um, it took off after the uh, Second World War. Right, so we're talking about the 1950s and into the 60s and after. Um, and I think in some ways that the way in which Taiko performers now use several different drums, right, differentiates um, Kumi Daiko from the, uh, the, the centuries-old ritual of Japanese drumming, which was done at a lot of uh, religious festivals. Right? So the modern form of Taiko uses this ensemble of drums. So you see, uh, and I don't, do they have names, right? Do yeah, the true Daiko, O Daiko, Shimei Daiko. Yes, the different, as well as uh, many flute yeah. and, yeah. and other kinds of percussive instruments. Um, and certainly, um, I think uh, the popularity of this kind of post-World War II Taiko took off with uh, groups like uh, Kodo, um, uh, which some of you may know, a very, very uh, kind of incredible experience you can hear it. It's very visceral. So uh, in North America, uh, I think, uh, you know, it started really in the 60s, the late 60s. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it is sort of 1968, right? The late 60s, it's this period of, of kind of identity formation for uh, different kinds of uh, non-white uh, groups, including Asian Americans. Um, so it's interesting how, to me, how Japanese taiko sort of formed in the kind of uh, post-World War II reconstruction of Japanese national identity, right? Looking for what are the roots, what is the true uh, Japanese American uh, Japanese identity, and then the Asian American identity also grew up with the, in the period of Asian American activism. Right, that people were looking for maybe the cultural component to the political consciousness raising that was going on about the marginalization of Asian Americans through U.S. history. Um, so there were a number of groups that were formed by uh, Japanese Americans, uh, Sansei, third generation, uh, and then other Asian American groups also formed, and those were pan-ethnic groups, uh, like Nudaiko is uh, pan-ethnic. 
Um, so at this time, uh, uh, Deborah uh, sort of counts about maybe 150 to 200 groups, uh, most of them amateur, right? There are some professional groups. Um, uh, they are often community-based, right? And some of them are connected to uh, kind of religious organizations, and some of them are, like Mudaiko, more secular. So just raising a few questions about Taiko um, as a kind of uh, instance of Asian American culture, which has a kind of political edge. Right? To what extent does Taiko make a statement that's not just about musical enjoyment? Right? And it is very musical enjoyment. And musically enjoyable. But to what extent do we look at Tycho and kind of interpret some kind of social message and in, maybe even impose it on this? And I would say that, um, you know, Tycho form, the history of Tycho, was part of a larger search for a kind of Asian American culture, broadly speaking. Right? That it's sometimes said that since there isn't one Asian American culture, you kind of have to invent it. Right? That, that there has to be a cultural form in which many people from many different ethnic backgrounds, um, perhaps many generations of uh, once removed from Asia, and many different, you know, sort of personal experiences in which they can kind of meld into one. Right? So there's a kind of interesting communal aspect to Taiko where it seems like when people are playing that they're sort of uniformly scripted and they move all together in this wonderful synchronization. But really when you talk to them backstage, they're so different. <laughs> so part of it is sort of making all these individuals look like holes. Um, uh, also, I think Taiko in itself is, is very, you know, because of the power of the drum, right? It, it sort of speaks to the desire for a kind of social power, right? A desire for visibility, a desire to be heard, right? And Asian Americans um, have a long history of participating in music, uh, uh, lots of musical forms, but these forms are often coded as either white or black, right? So Asian Americans are not often recognized as hip hop artists, for instance, or as jazz artists, right? They tend to be somewhat I uh, think the thought of as, you know, not a mainstream part of those forms. So Taiko seems much more immediately coded as Asian, right? Um, I think in some ways it's interesting that this uh, kind of coding as Asian often um, lends itself to thinking about to what extent um, is Taiko authentic, right? The, the question that always comes, how, how do you perform Taiko authentically? And I think I overheard Jen sort of talking about the improvisatory nature of Taiko, the fact that it's always changing, that there's something kind of unpredictable about it. Maybe a little bit not unlike uh, Asian American culture, right? Which again, doesn't necessarily have its roots in a, a traditional Asian culture, but is a kind of invented and dynamic mix. Um, so my final question, um, you know, maybe some, some uh, questions about the reception um, that uh, the ensemble couldn't speak to. Um, that there are sometimes worries about uh, the way in which Taiko is used as a kind of Asian um, uh, com commodity, right? That, that Taiko appears to sort of dress up something as Asian. Um, and, I think that there's a long history of kind of European and American interest in Asia, right, as a source of commodities, right? So, so one side of Tycho is that, you know, it could be exo uh, exoticized, right? It could just be thought of as part of this kind of multicultural smorgasbord that people just partake of, you know, and they're like, oh, isn't that cool? Isn't that exotic? Um, uh, and I think, you know, there's this linkage of Taiko with Asian Americans that sometimes forgets the extent to which Taiko performers are not always Asian American, right? And so there's this kind of questioning, and I've heard actually this comment made, um, people are surprised to see non-Asian performers of Taiko, right? And there are many and very accomplished at that. And so um, there's a concern about uh, cultural appropriation, right? To what extent should Taiko be sort of opened up and just made uh, a form that is um, available or, or 
are given to all. Um, I would say on that matter, um, you know, my sons are in a public school and they've had Tycho talk to them as classes. Uh, it's a wonderful practice, um, as you all have heard. I'm going to hand it over to Cindy to raise some more questions and then I think we'll just talk. Okay, great. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, so, as you were performing, um, yeah, sure. I don't know, but you know, I mean, like, look at him. So, as you were performing, um, I was noticing um, these techniques of the body. So, um, well, one, the, your stances, um, you know, your stances with your legs out, um, and then looking up at the drum sticks um, before um, hitting the head of the drum, like following it and sometimes turning your body towards it. So I have, a, I have several questions about techniques of the body. So um, one, if you could d in, in, like, let us know like, where, where do these techniques come from? Like, what informs your your actual moves in that performance. Um, thank you. Uh, so for me, one of the things that makes Taiko so interesting is the kata, or the way, the form of the drumming. Mm -hmm. So um, in some ways, the actual rhythms themselves are actually quite simple, especially mm -hmm. when you compare them to um, other sort of world drumming traditions. But it's the way you have to use your body to play those rhythms that makes it much more complex and, to me, really challenging and, and, and interesting in a special way. So the idea is that um, Sort of like martial arts, you're trying to draw energy from the earth and use your lower body in your center. That's where your power comes from, not your muscles, not your arms. And that by using sort of your center to play the drums, then your arms are relaxed and sort of like, um, like a whip or even a spaghetti noodle is the idea. Um, so most people when they look at drumming they think oh they just think of like arms and muscles but it's really about like having like really good lower body strength. Um, when you first learn taiko you'll be in that stance and your, your thigh will start to quiver way earlier than your arms will give out. Um, so the idea is kind of using a lot of the physicality through um, similar to martial arts. Um, San, uh, San Francisco Taiko Dojo, the first uh, taiko school in North America, um, Seiji Tanaka who started that and continues to run it today, he um, uh, has three black belts in martial arts, and he actually mm -hmm. intended to open a martial arts studio, but then um, missed hearing taiko drums in the Cherry Blossom Festival, and so opened a taiko <coughs> studio instead. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the way North Americans play taiko is very much influenced by him and sort of his teachings and uh, his students going on to start their own groups. In fact, our, our teacher Rick Shiomi studied with him, and so we're kind of a third generation from that group, or no, second generation, I guess, from that group. Um, but each, each taiko group has sort of a different kata and a different feel. The other thing that informs our particular mudaiko style of playing is that um, relationship with theater mu. So mu, M-U, is the um, uh, uh, Korean pronunciation of a Chinese ideogram of the shaman warrior artist that connects the heavens to the earth through the tree of life. So all of that imagery and sort of sensibility also bleed, sort of um, uh, cross inspired the taiko and the theater. So um, a lot of the earlier uh, theater mu works were inspired by Korean mask dance, where you have those long sleeves that really extend out. And this idea that your energy extends past your wrist and past your bachi or your drumstick, but out into space. And so the other thought behind that was when you're playing this one drum, you're not just playing that drum, you're playing all these imaginary drums around you. And in that way, you can expand your energy and be bigger and reach out kind of this way instead of just you and the drum, you and the drum, you and the drum this is the only thing that matters. There's some groups that play very much with that relationship just between the self and the drum and you can kind of like blur out everything else. As a group, Mudaiko tends to um, kind of always be looking for that larger connection kind of thing. <coughs> so our style, specifically Mudaiko, has a lot more emphasis on that, where other groups may be more drum focused, um, I would say. Okay. Are, are there um, <coughs> any techniques of the body as you're, you're playing, like either your group or other groups that you've seen that are specifically gendered or marked um, 
as gender, or how does gender work? I find that very interesting <laughs> because, of course, you know, it being traditionally played by men in Japan, and then in North America, what happens somehow is it flipped, and um, sort of um, most taiko groups you'll see predominantly women, like 70% women players. So something happened there was really interesting. Um, you know, when I, for those who were here earlier, I mentioned Tiffany Tamarabuchi as a, a female um, odaiko player, the big, large, large drums, and she won, went to Japan, competed, and won first place in their national odaiko competition. And that was, like, earth-shattering. To do it even today would be earth-shattering. Um, and part of the reason is that even in Japan, um, now, where women now do play, um, and there's some very strong female taiko um, groups in Japan. Um, for example, kodo, uh, there's styles of drumming that they really do kind of reserve for the men. They're the more powerful, um, more physical kinds of drumming, like the big odaiko drumming. You know, you'll see them um, dressed in uh, fundoshi, you know, and their muscles rippling, and they'll, they'll play those giant drums. Um, and then they'll also style the drum, um, uh, yatai bayashi, where the drum is seated down and you're in a sit-up position while you play. Um, those styles of drumming, even for the women who have trained right alongside the men and are, um, you know, in all purposes have the same sort of level, the men will always play those pieces in Kodo. And the women will play the more pretty or the more graceful styles of drumming that, you know, kind of have more dance-like elements. And so there's still that barrier in Japan and um, it's definitely not there in North America. You see women really kind of taking leadership roles and doing all of those parts. But it was interesting because the most recent North American Taiko conference that we went to, um, I think there was, you know, they, they usually draw anywhere from 400 to 700 Taiko players from North America um, for this conference. And they always open with uh, the sort of uh, Taiko history in a nutshell for all the people who are new to Taiko. Um, they have slide presentations, sort of talk through a mini history of Taiko. And um, what we realized is year after year, like, there are no women in this slide presentation. And, I, and it was interesting because a wonderful person who was giving the presentation, who I respect greatly, and uh, um, I could tell he sort of realized it as he was giving the presentation. And he started speaking in asides about women and being like, oh, and also this person really supported this person. And it's because of this person that that person, you know. And he would start to try and sneak in mentions to women and their leadership roles in the community, but they weren't actually in the presentation. And I, and I just noticed that kind of for the first time of being like, what? <laughs> you know? Um, so there is. That's still the case, I feel, a little bit um, in the U.S. as well. And then there's one more thing that um, we sort of talked about in that for in North America, it's really hard to get to that professional level of taiko playing that's like the world class level. Partly because most of us don't grow up playing taiko or having the opportunity to study or play taiko. Um, and so many people come to it later in life. Um, uh, but at any rate, to um, one of the sort of the main ways you can get your training is to go to Japan and to um, be an apprentice and basically um, you know spend several years washing floors and um, cooking and running up and down mountains and studying alongside of um, these these wonderful teachers and groups that are willing to sort of take you under their wing. Um, but I would say that for a woman to do that is very difficult. Number one, to find a group that's willing to train you. Number two, oftentimes there's relationship or family sort of obligations. And so it's much easier, or it seems to me, that more men are able to do that, study in Japan, come back, and try to carve out their professional careers than women. And, you know, there's, again, there's many reasons for that, but it's still kind of the, the case right now. So I think there's, you know, there's a lot of kind of things going on um, around that for sure. Uh, well, what about you all? Do you have some questions as you are listening to this or, or watching the performance? Or if you have questions from earlier, if we were here for the discussion earlier? Yeah. Um, is there any improvisation done during the performance? Absolutely. 
Yes, um, there's, there's often, sort of like in jazz, there's also um, points where people get to do their solos. Mm -hmm. um, different groups, uh, for example, we had guest artists recently, own Ensemble um, from LA, and they're very much moving their ensemble towards more world um, fusion music, um, and they operate more like almost a jazz ensemble. So a lot of their pieces have a structure, but have huge amounts of improvisation within them. For our Daiko group, many of us are not trained musicians, Susan being one of the few exceptions, <laughs> a few others um, who you know, actually have musical background, but many of us came to Taiko without having a, a musical background, so for many of us, practicing, knowing what we're supposed to do, when to do it, sort of like learning your dance step and learning it well and sticking to it. Um, so for us, improvisation is a little bit more of a challenge than for, for other groups, but we, we incorporated in some level um, kind of throughout the concerts, for sure. And just quick following on, is there a difference between then the typo that's in Japan and that's in North America with regard to how much they improvise? Uh, no, I wouldn't say that element. Okay. You know, in, sort of there's all levels of playing taiko, you know, and certainly the professionals in Japan can improv three hours of taiko just, you know, <laughs> off the cuff. And then the sort of community groups who kind of, you know, know their two songs and that's all they play. Um, so there's a wide range, you know, for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Question over here. Could you touch a little bit on the communication that's going on between drummers while you're performing? Sure, mm -hmm. Susan, do you want to take that one? That's easy. Sure, that's what we call kiai, and I don't know what the exact translation is. Could you help with that? Kiai, expression of shouting. Yeah. <laughs> shouting. <laughs> shouting. Um, so those can be for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, it could be like a sign that I need more encouragement from my fellow drummers, or if you just want to encourage them during a solo, like yeah, keep going. You know. Um, it becomes more and more important, of course, at, in those moments as we get tired, you know, towards the end of a show. Um, but it can also be for, you know, to communicate to the audience. We, at least one of the main reasons I play music in, in a number of forms is to exchange energy with um, the audience member, between me and the instrument, and with others on stage. So that's, that applies to every type of music that I play. Um, so that's also one reason. And then the, the last reason um, I would point out is just the, it could be kind of a placeholder. If we're playing don, 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 ga, 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 don, do, su, don, do. So we're not actually playing in those, in those moments. We might insert a ki just as a musical placeholder. How is the music written down? Mm. Do you want to take that? <coughs> um, traditionally, no sheet music. And uh, we do kuchi shoka. Kuchi means mouth, and shoka means singing. Mm -hmm. And for example, the first song we played today, that's Matsuri, and we learned uh, by kuchi shoka. Like, shoka goes like, Don, 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 kara, kaka, don, don, sut, don, don, kara, kaka. Don is big hit, mm -hmm. and kara is rim hit. Mm -hmm. So that's the way, traditionally. But these days, <laughs> we have lots of technologies, so <laughs> there are lots of ways to learn it. But that's the traditional way. Thank you. Um, you talked about this a little before you started. Um, smiling. <laughs> Um, the fact that, that it's not done in Japan traditionally, uh, well, 50 years tradition, um, and, and American um, uh, type of players are encouraged to smile. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that? Sure. I can talk about that because I, I've tortured Michiko for many years and now she's come around to, to my side. <laughs> um, the, the relationship with the audience is, is different and it's interesting because of sort of audience expectations and the kinds of things that audiences will respond to. Um, I found that North American audiences respo respond to personalities and in individuals. Like for example, they don't want to see the same expression on everybody's face. They want to feel like they kind of see glimpses of um, your own personal spirit brought in. You may be playing the same moves and playing 
playing the same song, but people start to respond to you on an individual way in the land of individuals, right? Um, and so bringing that out, your personality, and showing that is part of my challenge as the artistic director and trying to get people to do that. I find that, number one, um, sort of like in sports, too, or anything, when you're co everybody has a I'm concentrating very hard face, facial expression that they use whenever they're working on something internally. Um, and so my, uh, my challenge is to get everybody out of your concentration face into your I'm connecting, I'm communicating, I have something to say, I have something to share, I have a feeling, and this is what I'm sharing now. And you don't need to know that I'm working really hard to remember not to trip over my left foot on that third note. Um, you're, you're, think, you're wanting to connect to the music and the, and the, and the emotion. And so we're, I'm always trying to get people to bring themselves up in their faces. Um, and that's the actor and the theater training in me as well. And then also, um, there's a, a Midwesternness <laughs> that I find, um, both in audiences and in performers, where there's a certain kind of Midwestern pleasantness. <laughs> and they, you can see their body, like if you cut off their head, their body's like, oh, I'm going crazy, they're working so hard, and on their face they're <laughs> you know, so my challenge is to connect the whole thing, body, spirit, mind, kind of get it all sort of on the same frequency. And so uh, for North American groups, you'll see much more of that kind of individual expression valued and encouraged. And I feel like um, you can see that absolutely in Japanese groups as well, but there's a different aesthetic and there's a different feeling. And I feel like what you often see is this absolute synchronicity in Taiko Japanese groups that we can't, we aspire to, but we don't quite get there. Um, and that's where they don't want individuals to stick out. You want to look at the group as a whole and see how everybody has the exact same expression, the exact same feeling, the exact same breath, you know. Um, and that is its own kind of expression and artistry. You'll also find Japanese audiences often uh, respond, or there's a different attention span, I'll say that. Um, number one, the, um, having been exposed to Taiko as an art form, they have uh, probably different levels of appreciation and recognition of the art form and familiarity with it. And so they can watch an Odaiko solo go for 20 minutes and just be utterly enthralled because they, you know. And then for US kind of audiences, they're sort of like, well, that was amazing for 10 minutes, but now I'm thinking about other things, you know. And so there's a different attention span that you're kind of working with. And, and also, like, one thing that Japanese audiences I find, and this is very generalized, of course. Um, discussion, but is a, a real appreciation for endurance. They love to see somebody going past their physical endurance, beyond that, and keep going. And that just is like the, that's the yummy, gooey part of the performance, is to see somebody push past their sort of levels of, of, of self and endurance and, and see them go and go and go. And, and for the U.S., to get to that level, you've kind of worn out your welcome sometimes. <laughs> and you kind of want to move on to a different kind of feeling or a different note. Um, so that was a tangent. Can I add a story yeah. that when my, uh, my sons were little and they watched Jen play in a number of Taiko concerts, and, and they referred to her as the smiley one. <laughs> She's the smiley one. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm not completely on your side, Jen. <laughs> now I'm smiling. Um, but um, I'm believing in <clears throat> inner joy. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm not smiling, I'm enjoying the performance of Taiko and communi communicating with Taiko and communicating with something around me and I still want to um, think that that's very important so 99% um, on your side <laughs> <laughs> the rest of it <laughs> right and yeah. the mood and the, the sort of the soul of any piece would be different yes a smile may be absolutely inappropriate for another song um, that's asking you to go to a different place emotionally <laughs> and internally where you're like <laughs> Why is that person smiling? That's so. Ugh. Um, but yes, the idea of that, whatever that core emotion 
or sort of soul of the pieces, that's the thing you want to make sure you can kind of share or explore with your with your audience. Yeah. And do, do you ever play for marriage, divorce, or uh, funerals? Or <laughs> uh, we have not been asked to play for a divorce. But we, we have been asked to play for um, for weddings and uh, funerals, yes. Wow. Yeah, um, not as often, certainly it's not like we're filling our calendars with them, but yes. <laughs> when we get to do a performance, we could we get physically, emotionally, spiritually, what do you do to invite the group? What do I do to? The group, no, we recharge. Recharge? Um, for me, just speaking personally, Tycho is my recharge. So all the rest of life and day, you know, can be very heavy, and I'm very exhausted, and I come to Tycho thinking, oh, and then I walk out thinking, oh, you know. So for me, like the act of Tycho and sort of clearing through all that energy and getting out of sort of a lot of crap, Tycho is a very clean energy and a clean space for me personally. Um, can I, I want to elaborate on the gender question a little bit, and I was especially wondering about gender and choreography, and like how choreography in the in the, uh, North American context developed, given the gender dynamics or the that you talked about and the, the role of women. And um, I was especially thinking about that because um, I don't know if you saw the last night on Colbert, there was like a yeah, 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 yeah. And to me, that performance seemed not only so gendered but sexualized. What, what was you know, it? Um, there was a type of group. Or, I don't know if it's Taiko, it seemed like. Yeah, I would say they're, um, they're, the, they're the Las Vegas version of Taiko. In, <laughs> in terms of, especially even for, for the Japanese you know, scene, they would be seen as the sort of flashier style. They're pushing the, the performance spectacle elements. But I, I agree, like, when I was watching it, some of those things came to my mind as well. But could you say a little bit, in your context, I mean, in the North American context, where sure. it's been more women, how that's affected the choreographic performance and tradition that's developed here? Yeah, I w okay, I would say that um, it's interesting. There, there's some, some leaders, uh, female leaders, who have really um, strongly influenced the choreographic style of Taiko in North America. PJ um, Hirabayashi out of San Jose Taiko is one of them. Michelle Fuji out of um, the Portland Taiko area is another one. Um, one element that's always present or always being explored is um, styles of Jap Japanese folk dance and Taiko. And there's a real sort of synergy in the kinds of movements and ways of moving your body. Um, but in terms of sort of the genderizedness of, of, of um, the choreography, I would say that it's interesting because we will have a piece that is is maybe more movement flowy, dancey, more feminine in style, and we will be sort of forcing our male players to um, live in that uh, world in terms of their bodies and their movements and their energy, and some of them are excellent at it and really fill the ensemble and then others it's you know it's like a square peg it doesn't it's a little jarring um, and likewise there are some of us who would more than love to be the powerful Odaiko player but just physically may not have that sort of strength or endurance or that sort of um, energy presence but I would say in terms of um, many groups um, some of their most powerful players are women and some of their most graceful players are men, and there's a little bit more of that mix in North America where they're not quite so, it's not nearly as genderized as it is from Japan, I would say. But, for example, there's, there was a, there's a little controversy about Taiko Project, maybe, I don't know how many years ago now, some of the women did a, a Mitsubishi uh, commercial where they're like drumming and they have these really sexy outfits and there was like, you know, a lot of buzz in the taiko community like either A, is that great? They're like in a national commercial, it's taiko drumming, getting more exposure, getting probably paid very well, that's awesome. And then other people are like, that's, you know, that's sexist and, um, uh, you know, exploitative and, you know, etc. And I think, you know, anytime you sort of enter that realm of who is this performance for? 
is the question I always have. And for me, if it's to express something that your group has, um, that your group is trying to express, and people will interpret it any which way they will, you know, at least you know sort of at the core what it is you're trying to express, or as a group, are you trying to um, fill this slot of like what you think people want, or what you think will sell, or what you think will have attention? And I think those different perspectives may influence any person's opinion of the integrity or value or interest of that, you know, as art. But at the same time, like if somebody paid me to put on a silly outfit and play a tecla drum, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't turn that down necessarily. I just might not be, you know, that might not be my soul's work in that moment. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I would say that most um, North American female taiko drummers will not stand for it. <laughs> for the most part, I would say. I think we have time for one more oh, sorry. question. Yeah. I was just going to ask about the, uh, a new student to it. Uh, how hard is it? What are some of the challenges? Or what do you think they come up against in their uh, experience of learning taiko? Um, well, I would say that anytime you, like, especially as an adult, take on a new skill, I, I just think that's such a brave thing to do because most of us try so hard to be competent and to appear competent and sort of gain some kind of skills and and um, and then you go into this new place and you feel like a kid who can't tie their shoes. Um, for us, it's getting people to live to be in their bodies is really the 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 biggest challenge for most people. The rhythms are what scare people the most, especially if they're not musicians. But that's actually the easiest part. The hardest part is to get people to sort of relax, feel comfortable in their bodies. It's almost like teaching dance, I would say. And, and the methodology is similar to teaching dance um, in terms of learning phrase by phrase, learning, trying to get it, the physicality and the sensibility into your body and sort of build from there. Um, so I think that's the biggest challenge for our, our students. And I think that's the perfect segue to now you get to try this. Yeah. So let's thank our, our panelists. And